Hey everybody, what's up? Chad Wesley Smith, Juggernaut Training Systems Beers with Chad coming at you. Um, today I am drinking Knee Deep Brewing Company Hoptologist Double IPA. Cheers. That's a good nine percenter right there. And I'm talking about uh, a little bit, a quick kind of overview of my whole athletic history from uh, birth as the hashtag giant headed baby all the way to now the pajama wrestling juggernaut you see in front of you. Uh, and then answer a couple questions from you, the fans of, uh, of Instagram. So we do that. Uh, and beyond that, if you're interested in online coaching, juggernaut AI, powerlifting, power building, weightlifting, jujitsu, strength and conditioning, coaching all available at jtsstrength.com. Totally personalized for you. Quadrillions. Quadrillions. Uh, five quadrillion, in fact. Permutations to the powerlifting program. That's a five with 14 zeros after it. So I highly suggest you check that out. Uh, because if you're doing a template or you're doing some free program on the internet, you probably just want to be weak, apparently. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Otherwise, if you want some clothes, Juggernaut clothes, jtsstrength.com books, you can use Brain Gains with a Z for 25% off books right now because maybe you can't train because you're stuck in the quarantine. So uh, at least train your brain. And you can get clothes from Roan, R-H-O-N-E dot com. 20% off your first order by using Jug Life, J U G G L I F E, or from my friends at Virus International, the good kind of virus, use JTS10 for 10% off your orders there. This is Beers with Chad. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Hey everybody, what is up? Chad Wesley Smith here, CEO, founder, Juggernaut Training Systems, Beers with Chad. Update from last week, new cast, beautiful blue color, mostly just for the way it sets off my eyes. Um, I'm very proud of this cast, mostly because when they gave it to me, it fit kind of shitty. And uh, anyone who knows me knows that I'm incredibly not handy. So getting my brain percolating and deciding to melt or boil this, and put this in boiling water like a mouthpiece and reform it to my arm. I was quite proud of uh, my accomplishments there. Today we are drinking from Knee Deep Brewing Company, Hoptologist Double IPA. Good old fashioned nine percenter from uh, Deep knee. They got several good beers I've had from here. So today I'm wanting to talk a little bit about uh, cheers, cheers. Give you some insight into my my athletic career all the way from, from the, uh, the early days, the very earliest days, and then answer some questions that you find folks asked me on Instagram. So let's just uh, dive right into it. 10 pounds, three ounces, 75% of that was head, uh, born in Whittier, California. It's probably a security question on something. Uh, but yeah, born, I'm 33 years old, I'll be 34 in July. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm adopted uh, at birth. I'll talk about, I'll just save that whole thing from another, for another episode. But uh, adopted, went home from the hospital with the family that raised me, my, my family. Um, yeah, and just always been obsessed 
with sports from as early as I could possibly remember. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, my, my, I have two older brothers, Adam and Zach. Adam is 12 years older than me. Zach is nine years older than me. So, you know, I'm four years old and I'm seeing my, my 13 and 15 year old brothers and Zach, my middle brother, yeah, he was playing club soccer and playing in these tournaments. And I was like the, the mascot on the sidelines of these soccer tournaments. Some pretty great picks I'll try and dig up for you of me uh, hitting like a sweet kind of Burt Reynolds playgirl type of pose, like leaned on the, on the ball bag, sipping a Capri Sun, maybe a high C, eating a PB and J, uh, or being on the sidelines of my oldest brother Adam's football games, being like a de facto little ball boy kind of uh, role there. But I was exposed to sports very early. My you know, brothers would be home in the driveway playing basketball or whatever, and I was just into it. Um, so I started playing soccer when I was four, maybe five. Um, swim team, local uh, neighborhood swim team. If you grow up where I did, Orange County, Irvine, California, swim team is a big deal. Every neighborhood, uh, like every little community, mass plan community in Irvine has their own swim team. And we go to battle every summer in the Irvine, for the Irvine championships. I was on the Troll Rock Rockets. Butterfly, freestyle, backstroke, sucked at breaststroke. Um, but yeah, most five-year-olds could not match my shoulder development in the, uh, in, the, in the butterfly particularly. And I was a very, very good youth swimmer, uh, even swimming for the Irvine Nova Aquatics, which is, I think, probably the most successful club swim team in the United States. Uh, so, you know, I did that a lot. Started playing basketball. I think when I was eight years old, um, you know, every, every morning I would, I would wake up probably five thirty, six o'clock. I've always been, been an early bird in that regard. I'd wake up early and I'd be downstairs watching the like 6 a.m. Sports Center. And this is, you know, 93, 94, 95, 96, that kind of time range from when I'm you know, six to nine years old. So this is prime Michael Jordan. This is this is Dallas Cowboys dynasty. This is a, a great sports time and I'm watching that stuff and then I'd go out in the driveway for 30 minutes before I get picked up. Uh, my carpool would pick me up to go to school and just shooting baskets, trying to do what I did uh, in the, or trying to do what I saw right then on Sports Center. I remember having these we had these VHS tapes called The Year in Sports with so 1991 and 1993. And I think those were the, the kind of free gifts that you get when you subscribe to Sports Illustrated back in the day, like, you know, subscribe now and every issue is $3.99 instead of $6.99 and you get this, this uh, free VHS tape. And I would watch those endlessly. Like, I, I bet I've watched them well over 100 times each and would just try and copy that stuff and was so into it and, and like I wrote a paper a, a paper I wrote a story at school it would have been in second grade I think first or second grade and the story I wrote was all about the 1993 NBA finals that's Bulls versus Suns Jordan versus Barkley um, wrote about that wrote about how Horace Grant blocked a shot to like win to end game six all this stuff always just so into it the point of when I tried out or when, when I was going to play football for the first time, I was nine years old, uh, Irvine Chargers, Junior All-American football, and I knew that there was some level of tryout to this, to this uh, team. So to prepare myself for that, I may have just been on a binge marathon alternating uh, Little Giants and Rocky IV because I was taking... The, those car bungee cords, you know, that you would use to like tie stuff down in the back of a truck. And I lashed as many of them as I could find together, tie myself to a tree in the, in the backyard and was running like band resisted sprints at eight years old, all on my, you know, my, my own ideas were coming up with this. Uh, so that's how into it I, I was. And uh, so soccer was big, big for me when I was young, played club soccer. Swimming was big, played, uh, you know, swam for, for a very renowned club team. Basketball was pretty significant for me. You know, played AAU travel basketball. And then uh, 
there was a point when I was eight or nine years old that I didn't make some specific club soccer team. So I decided, hey, let me go and try and do track with uh, my best friend from elementary school and, and junior high, Kevin Arts. He was killing it in, as a distance runner. So I was like, yeah, I'll go do track. And I was, uh, was a shot putter and a sprinter. Uh, at the time, I think it was probably 50 and 100 meter, maybe even 50 and 100 yard. I'm not totally sure, but, uh, but did that. Started in track when I was eight years old and continued that all the way until I was 24 or right before I turned 24. Um, so once I got into high school, it was football and track. Uh, in football, I was an offensive and defensive lineman. Um, you know, when I started out in high school, my freshman year of high school, first day of freshman year, I was about five foot eight, 170 pounds. By the time I graduated high school, I was six foot or six one, um, probably six foot, and I'm about six one now. 275 pounds, 270 pounds, right in that. So I gained 100 pounds in high school. That was on a delicious combination of chocolate milk, the whole box of Kraft mac and cheese with like a pound of hamburger mixed in, a stag steakhouse chili, if you're familiar with that, a lot of like two for one burrito deals and a shitload of, of lifting, like two, three, four hours a day, five or six days a week, uh, all the time. and. I was just always really into it. So in, in football, uh, I ended up by, by senior year being uh, like an Orange County All-Star player, all CAF, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I was not particularly big. Even, even now I'm 295 and frankly with uh, quarantine and drinking and too much time to cook, I'm, uh, I think I was like 301 this morning, so I gotta curtail that right now. Um, but I don't think most people wouldn't think that I weighed that much. And when I was 265, 275 in high school, I had college football coaches asking me if I weighed 225. So I didn't get re recruited by too many big schools. UCLA, I, I took official visit there for, for football and, and that kind of thing, but got offers from smaller schools, Davis, San Luis Obispo. But track was, was really my sport, throwing the shot put in a discus. Uh, so I was a two-time CIF champion here, which is our Southern California section, some like 660 schools, something like that. Won that twice, and then went to the University of California, Berkeley, on a track scholarship to throw the shot put there. Uh, part of the number one men's recruiting class in the country, uh, according to Track and Field News, our 2004 recruiting class. And you know, got, got up there to throw, redshirted my first year, uh, my my roommate, one of my great friends, Nate Rolf, and I came in this recruiting class together. He was hammer throw, hammer and discus. I was shot put and a little bit of hammer. Uh, we were in, inseparable, like track, you know, well, first roommates in the dorms, uh, track team together, same events more or less, and probably half of our classes together. Great guy. Um, you know, we, we would, uh, we were both redshirting that year, so we decided to create our own team. So redshirting for track and field, you still get to compete at the meets, but we did not compete for Cal. Uh, we compete unattached. So we created Team Unattached, which had incredible uh, uniforms that we, we found at a local running store. These, these black singlets, royal blue stripe down the middle, uh, and then uh, singlets, I feel very European or Australian saying that I think European, I'd call it a vest. Australia is a singlet, a, uh, like a tank top. And then split leg runners shorts, these electric blue runner shorts to match the stripe. And we would compete as team unattached and we would try and beat the rest of the throwers from Cal in a little internal competition that we were having ourselves. So spent one year doing that. And then the next year uh, was on the team for the first semester and it just was not a good situation. I won't go too much into that, but I'll say of our number one men's recruiting class, it was three guys or 13 guys. And I think only three finished or uh, finished their career at Cal. Everyone else transferred or quit track. So I did one semester of track, my, the first semester of my second year. And then uh, the next semester I didn't do track or really lift, but I did party a lot. So that was fun. And uh, from there, decided to, I, I wanted to transfer, I tried to transfer to either University of Georgia or University of North Carolina, um, 
over Christmas break of that year, but the timing just you know was not right for that. So I ended up going back to Cal, partying a bunch, and then transferring uh, to a junior college down here in Southern California, where my best friend Paul and I, he was a javelin thrower at Cal. Um, uh, he and I still live maybe two miles apart. Lawyer, do you need any corporate litigation? Hit him up if you, you know, you need any, uh, any uh, criminal defense stuff. His wife, Martina Tyner, vigil uh, law defense, holler at her. You're welcome, Marty. Um, he, we moved down here to, to Newport Beach, lived about 100 meters from the sand. And at that point, I just wanted to coach. I was co- I started coaching high school football, started coaching high school track, started coaching, uh, running the off-season program for our football team. And I was 19, just turning 20. Uh, so that's, I've been coaching, you know, fairly full-time since since then. And, and I didn't have any interest in doing track anymore. I was kind of disillusioned by my experiences with Cal, as at Cal, as many people were. Though some of the coaches were great, and I love them, and have a lot of great friends from there, uh, and still you know support what support Cal went up to the Cal USC game this year, so go Bears. Uh, but it just was not the right situation for me, so we were just living at the beach. I was going to junior college sparingly, like six units of junior college, uh, living two hundred yards from the sand in Newport, partying a lot, and it was a great time, but. Uh, The next year came and I started going to a school called Concordia University in Irvine, California. And at Concordia, there was a coach named Len Blutrick and Coach Blue uh, had also coached me my junior and senior year of high school. And he asked me more or less as a favor, like, hey, just come out and throw for us. Like, you don't even really need to practice because it's a small school. Like, you'll score some points for us. Just just show up and and do it. So I I practiced like once or twice a week and it was really not into it. Still coaching football, offensive and defensive line, running the off-season program, uh, coaching coaching track, had a really good thrower, got a guy to go from 48 feet to 58 feet my first year, coaching in the shot put, and was a very part-time athlete at that point. I had about 20 months off of throwing in the middle of my track career, uh, which I don't recommend. That's not a good strategy. So... I had a frustrating year. My freshman year at Cal, my, my redshirt year, team unattached year, I threw 55 feet in the shot put. I had thrown with the high school shot 62-6 uh, prior to that. So 55 feet with the 16 my freshman year. And then this, my now my fourth year, I'm not holding my thumb up, my fourth year in college, fourth year? Sure. Um, fourth year in college, I only threw 53 feet one inch. And I was pissed and embarrassed and like uh, that kind of hurt my back and there's all kinds of all kinds of shit it was a bad year so uh, a couple weeks go by and I'm like you know tell my parents like I don't want to do track next next year and concord even though I had thrown very poorly for myself I'd actually you know scored a couple points for them at at nationals for for our small school and they were going to give me a little bit of scholarship money and concord is a private school uh expensive and uh, all that so my parents said you know if you want to go there uh, you need to do track and get the scholarship money uh, otherwise like you can't go there or at least we can't pay for it so I took the scholarship money uh, my parents helped me out my brother actually paid for a lot of it and then I took some student loans out as well and decided you know, after like a week-long pity party for, for myself about not wanting to do track anymore I decided like all right you have to do it. You know, you're going to do track, so we can't make it like last year. You gotta be good again. So that, that summer I started training my ass off again. Um, a lot of times I'd, I'd train with the high school football guys that I, that I coached or train at the same time as them during the summer because if I was training at the same time as these you know, 15, 16, 17 year olds, even though I was only 19 or 20, I was Coach Smith and Coach Smith could do no wrong in any of their eyes, so I could not, you know, miss reps. I couldn't miss any lifts. I could not show any level of weakness. So I just trained my ass off all summer, got back in way better shape. And the next year, after throwing 53 1, my redshirt junior, come back my senior, and threw 63 feet 10 inches, uh, won the NAIA indoors and outdoors. I think it was the third farthest throw that year among American collegiates. Uh, so that's D1, D2, D3, NAI all put together. 
and it was a great year. It was, it was fantastic. Um, right after the track season, uh, you know, probably through at nationals, like May 15th, uh, then the next week I was on a vacation with my family and was contacted about, because I, of all irony, I think that's the right phrase. I may not understand it like Alanis Morissette, but of all the irony, Cal Berkeley, where I had transferred away from, offered me a job as their, their uh, throws coach. And I decided to pass on that job. And after passing on that job, when some people heard that I was still staying in Southern California, uh, it came about an opportunity for, for an investor who had some interest if I wanted to open a gym. So I started writing what I thought was a business plan, so on and so forth, open juggernaut train systems. Same time that I opened up juggernaut train systems, Coach Blue, my coach in my last two years of college, my last two years of high school, someone who was just a great role model, like a, a grandfather kind of figure to me, uh, passed away from cancer. And that, that was a tough thing, but I knew I wanted to keep doing track to kind of honor Coach Blue for that next year. But, you know, between running Juggernaut, which that first year and any new small business owner can tell you, it's, it's just nonstop. It was 70 hours a week doing that. I'm trying to train, I'm coaching people all day on my feet. It was tough, so I uh, kept throwing through that season, you know, mostly without, a, without a, any real coaching situation. Um, I, I did, you know, to humble brag myself here, I, I got to work with John Godina, um, multiple time Olympian, multiple time national champion, uh, former collegiate record holder on a couple occasions. And then after I ended up retiring, he said to a mutual friend, he's, uh, who I don't think he knew that we were, that well, was a mutual friend, a guy named Zach Lloyd, uh, tells Zach, like, oh, you know that Chad Smith guy? He's like, yeah, he's like, he's like, oh man, he could throw 70 feet in a year. He's like, he just needs a coach. Uh, but that unfortunately was after I had retired though, it was a, a bit bittersweet, I guess, to hear him say something like that. So I threw in my last track meet in uh, May of 2010. Uh, so that one season as a post-collegiate. And at that point I realized like, man, I'm really strong. Uh, so what about this powerlifting thing? I was sponsored by Elite FTS at the time uh, as a shot putter. And I figured like, well, I mean, I'm with this powerlifting company. So let's, let's do a powerlifting meet. drink break. I need to say that before I take a drink because people listening to just the audio versions, they always tell me that it throws them off. They think that the, the feed died or something. So I, I was sponsored by Elite and I figured, you know, I might as well do a powerlifting meet. So I'd written the program, The Juggernaut Method, uh, about six months prior to that and was using it with a lot of clients in, in the gym. And we were a sport performance gym. This is 2009, early 2010. Powerlifting was not big. Weightlifting was not big. CrossFit had not really hit yet and helped grow those sports. And that's not what, I, I wasn't a powerlifter. We were not a powerlifting gym. We were a sport performance gym and that's where I coach. I coach football players and jujitsu and volleyball and soccer and water polo and swimming and all this stuff. So I was using the German method with them and I said, all right, I'm gonna use this for my own powerlifting meet. So I did it to the T, the exact same way it's written in the first book. Um, I started training for that and you know, training for that July, August, September, October, did my first powerlifting meet, ironic, uh, coincidentally the first USPA meet, the first one that existed in October, 2010, squatted 800, benched 462, deadlifted 700. Sorry. Sorry that you didn't do that at your first powerlifting meet. I have good genetics and I trained for a long time hate me because you ain't me. Uh, but yeah, I, I had a pretty good first powerlifting meet. Granted, I was a division one athlete and had been lifting weights for 10 years uh, very seriously at that point. So I go 800 in wraps, 462, 700. I think the seed, the seeds of my disdain, uh, dis yeah, disdain for equipped powerlifting began uh, with that experience too, because one, I didn't really even know what equipped powerlifting was going into it to the point that when I was contacting, you know, talking to the customer service person at Elite to get my, my singlet, 
uh, as a sponsored athlete, I got a whole free singlet and some free wrist wraps. It was not a good deal, but maybe that's the topic for another day. Um, they got like 31 articles and $40,000 from my book though. So I was talking to the customer service person and looking, I'm looking at this, the, the page on the website and I was like, oh, give me this one. Send me this metal ace pro squatter. And she's like, I thought you were competing raw. And I was like, I, I am. She said, well, that's a squat suit. And I said, what's that? Because I'm just looking at that, what, that squat suit, it looked just like a singlet to me. And one was $200 and one was $50. So I was like, oh, I better get this $200 one. It seems like it's gonna be way better. So I ask, I, I ask for the $200 singlet and find out that it's a squat suit, but I'm still not 100% sure what that was. Though I read every Elite FTS article, I've read every Westside uh, Barbell.com article at that point. I'm like, this is when Elite used to just release like four or five articles a week on Fridays and I would wait the whole week to read them. I, I had read literally like every article they had um, and I'd seen the word bench shirt or super suit, uh, but didn't, that had no context to me. So I didn't understand what it was. And then, then uh, I'm at my meet and I'm waiting to do rack heights or, or put my openers in or whatever. And this extremely fat, short guy uh, in the line next to me waiting to put, you know, to get his, I think, bench rack height, asked me what my opener, what, or what I'm opening at. And I said, 725. Uh, and this was the squat, and he kind of scoffed, <laughs> me too, in the bench. Uh, he bombed out. He was benching, <laughs> benching equipped, and then bombed out. Classic equipped benching move. Uh, but So that was the start of my, my powerlifting career, the Central California Open, San Luis Obispo High School, October 2010, the first US ever, first ever USPA meet. Went on from there, uh, started working with Josh Bryant as a coach for my next two meets. He helped me total 2165. Uh, then I squatted, the next meet I squatted 905, it was a 308. I weighed about 30, I weighed in at 305.8. I, I weighed that 305, 310, anywhere, you know, depending on the day. Uh, after that, bombed out of a meet. If you were at, ever at the first USPA Nationals, you may have been, been there when I bombed out at, at 825. I, on this 905 squad, or, uh, when I squatted 905, or maybe the attempt after I attempted 935, I really hurt my hip flexor and had like shit squat training the next, the next training cycle, but figured like, you know, it'll just happen at the meet and go to the meet, miss 825 twice, and then just pulled, pulled out of the meet because like, I just squatted 905. Uh, I ain't doing a meet where I squat 825. And it was in Vegas, my buddies were there. There was more important things to do than uh, lift shitty at a powerlifting meet. And at that point, the business of Juggernaut, this is late 2011, uh, so we've been open for about two years. We were gaining clients, but you know, lacked a system, lacked, we, we were breaking even. We broke even after about six months, but, but weren't able to kind of turn this corner and and a thing that a lot of in-person gyms probably struggle with. So at that point I was like, oh, you know, it's, it's probably better. And this I think was part of what contributed to the tough meet is we we're just really stressed out about, about the gym and about work. So I decided to take a step back from competing. We had a combine prep going. I was coaching high school, a bunch of high school football guys, getting ready to, getting them ready to go to college. And so those first from, from this meet in, I think November of 2011, where where I withdrew in Vegas to about March, mid March, uh, maybe yeah, mid March, early April of 2012. I was training like twice a week, had lost 20 pounds, was just focused on being a, a businessman. I I kind of was satisfied with with what I'd done in powerlifting. To be honest, I. I just squatted what was then the American record in the, in the 308s, a 900-pound squat. I was only one of two Americans uh, squatting 900 in competition at that time. And I figured, you know, I need to focus on coaching. I need to focus on, on growing, growing my business. And then I saw you know, a Facebook event or something for California's Strongest Man, which was going to be in, in Huntington Beach, the next city over from me in six days after I saw it. So I contacted the, uh, the promoter and asked him if I could still sign up. And he said, yes. So I, I signed up, 
I had never pressed a log before. Uh, uh, we had a log, I just never used it. And so I've tried to figure out how to use that, getting advice from people on Facebook. Um, uh, the only strong man thing I'd ever really done was flipped a tire. So I train, you know, the events as much as I could for a couple days. Show up there, I think I got fourth or fifth. Uh, Martin Litsis was competing there. Um, I, I still honestly think that I got third, but the, uh, the <laughs> I think that they fucked me on the scoring because the guys who run it, I, I now know, hate me. Um, that's another hate me because they ain't me situation. Uh, and I guess that would have been my first clue about it. They didn't want some guy who signed up six days before coming to their show and podiuming, but uh, that's neither here nor there. And But it, it was shitty weather, some of the worst weather I've ever had in Southern California, but it was a ton of fun. So I I was like, yep, strong man, I'm, I'm going for it, I'm doing this. I'd watched it on TV all growing up and I was, I was all in. So that was, what, now March of uh, 2012. I then did my next show, I think four weeks later, uh, barely missed by like two points, getting a Giants Live invite, uh, then just missed my pro card. And then in November, 2012, got my, my pro card and strongman by winning uh, NAS, North American Strongman Nationals. And I know there's a lot of federations now, but I don't exactly know what they all are, but at that time, NAS was the only one. So won the amateur nationals, turned pro, and then from there, 2013, kind of went back and forth competing powerlifting and strongman, had a, a, her, a couple of herniated discs, and then decided to come back from that with only powerlifting in 2014, 2015, 2016. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a, in a later episode, but, but that's kind of the deal. Little kid, every sport, swimming, soccer, basketball, track, you know, we had, I, I went to a private, uh, private school and that might have been probably the hardest competitions we had because of the 24 boys in my class that I went most of them through kindergarten through eighth grade with, eight of us ended up as division one scholarship athletes. So it was insanely competitive recess and lunch games of basketball, soccer, four square, tetherball, whatever it is. Um, and then track and, and football in high school and then on to uh, track and college and and uh, track as a post collegiate, then powerlifting, powerlifting and strongman, or powerlifting, strongman, powerlifting and strongman, then just powerlifting, and now jujitsu. And I'll talk about that that powerlifting to jujitsu transition in another episode as well. But here I want to I want to answer a couple of people's questions. So maybe the most common question on here is. Uh, are Marissa and I dating? And yes, we've actually been dating for on and off for about seven years. <laughs> we just never really share about it publicly because uh, to be honest, the idea of sharing your personal life on social media and even doing something like what I'm doing talking about right now is extremely awkward and strange to me. And I kind of think that maybe people should just mind their own business, but that's not the world we live in. Uh, so yeah, we've been, we've been together for a long time. I love her very much. She's as wonderful and beautiful and funny and talented as, uh, even more so than all of you see on, uh, Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff. Um, other questions. Let's see. Favorite bands. Um, He's wrote favorite bands, LOL. I don't know what's favorite or what's funny about that question. Maybe he meant it as like a secret. I mean, bands like West Side uh, type of accommodating resistance bands, which if so, well played, sir. But uh, if not, uh, as a specific favorite bands, uh, Tyler Childers is, is high. I mean, that he's getting played a lot in my car. If you want to know about my musical selections, the playlist on Spotify, World's Strongest Hipster, will give you a lot of insight to that. But, I man, I get all kind of, kind of stuff uh, that I listen to. Uh, so, early, well, so eighth, eighth grade. I was in eighth grade in 1999 into 2000. And while going to Mariner's Christian School here in Orange County, California, growing up in Irvine, uh, 
there was some point in eighth grade that I heard the song Bling Bling by the Cash Money Millionaires, and apparently I just thought, like, this fucking speaks to me. Because from that point on, Cash Money into those early 2000s, a lot of Dirty South rap, uh, you know, Lil Jon, Petey Pablo, all that stuff, all kinds of hip hop in the early 2000s. Uh, I don't know that this is a PC word to say, but I was a huge wigger. Uh, I wore Echo and Sean John and Timberlands and Air Force Ones and Fat Farm. I did not, I repeat, did not wear any FUBU. I knew that the us they were referring to was not me and I did not cross that barrier, but uh, that's part of the reason why I know how to sea walk, why I'm just so generally cool and soulful, I'd say, was, uh, was that time in my life. So I've got that kind of stuff. You can find some playlists, <laughs> playlists of that on my Spotify. Um, but yeah, no specific bands that I like always listen to, but go check that playlist out and you'll, you'll find a bunch of stuff like that. I uh, had a couple questions to the effect of if I had another job or a different career, what would I want that to be? So my degree is in history. Uh, like I said, I started coaching high school football and track uh, and running off-season programs when I was 19 years old. And I came back to Southern California from Cal really to, to do that, to become the head coach, uh, to become a, a head football coach for high school and kind of accompanying that here in California, at least, is being a teacher. So my degree is in history. So I planned on being a history teacher uh, and being a head, a head football coach. I was obsessed with coaching, coaching football from a leadership standpoint, from a uh, personal development standpoint, from a strategy stand, standpoint, team culture, all that stuff. Uh, if, you, if you are not familiar with De La Salle High School, uh, I think uh, The Game Stands Tall, they made a, a movie about it. The, the book of that is much better. There's also a book called One Great Game. There's uh, documentaries called The Perfect Effort and uh, One... I, I think is the other one. Everything about Dale De De Sal High School, I was obsessed, obsessed with because they were so amazing in their team culture and, and that led them to not losing a game for 12 years, 151 straight, straight games. So that is the career path I was on, was coaching high school football and being a high school teacher. Uh, thank God I am not that because even when you're the head coach, you still got a boss, the athletic director and the principal and superintendents, all that stuff. Uh, when you're a teacher, you got a bunch of bosses Kids these days, yeah, that's right. I said kids these days seem like they're pricks, so I don't really want to teach them. Uh, I don't do well with a boss, so I'm glad that I diverted that, though I did very much enjoy my time coaching high school football. So that that's probably the career path I was on. As far as other careers that interest me, when I was a kid, I always wanted to... Uh, uh, I There were two, two jobs besides like professional athlete kind of things. I wanted to be a sports agent. Uh, we had a guy who goes to, to the church my family goes to um, named Jeff Morad. And uh, he's like a real big time agent, like a Lee Steinberg type of guy, Scott Boraz type of guy. I got to meet him and, and talk to him about, about being an agent. So I was really into that. I was also really into the idea of being on like ESPN, being a sports caster, sports announcer. And if there's anything else that I want to do now it would be that kind of thing the uh you know doing sports podcasts and and sports talk type of stuff you know whether Colin Coward big fan of him definitely my my favorites Marissa's gonna make fun of me when she hears this Bill Simmons show I tried to slide in the in the Bill Simmons DMs a couple times like just to see if he wanted to be friends and he never read them uh but probably my number one favorite uh, just person to listen to for sports talk stuff is Ryan, Ryan Rosillo. Uh, I think we have a very similar sense of humor in our early and mid nineties references. And yeah, I just like his takes on a, on a lot of stuff. So that's something that I'm, and I would like to do if I wasn't doing this or would even like to do in addition to doing this is, is that kind of sports talk stuff. 
A lot of what's my favorite beer questions. Uh, probably number one on the list is Alpine Duet uh, IPA from Alpine Brewing Company down in Alpine, California. I always thought that they were from Colorado because they have mountains and stuff on their on their label, but it's uh, in like kind of inland San Diego. Um, yeah, it's great. Nelson from there is great. I, I don't know that I've ever, windows up, I've, I've never had a bad beer from, from Alpine and they very kindly sent me a, uh, some, some beers uh, for mentioning them before. So if you guys want to do that again, I'll drink them. Uh, and last question I'll talk about today uh, favorite books. I see, I see that one on here too. And I'm going to say favorite non-training books. Um, I've been reading a lot more reading with my ears, audiobooks. Uh, I couldn't tell you the last time I like read with my eyes, uh, a book, but, but audiobooks of the, the ones that are saved on my phone, sports gene is up there. Range is up there, both by David Epstein. I just finished good to great. I'm, uh, I just finished another book called The End of Marketing. So I've been a bit more into the business type of books lately. Uh, but I used to read when I was coaching high school football, that was something I was really into was reading like biographies and personal development, leadership type of books. Uh, when the Game Stands Tall, Dale Sal book is a great one. But if there is one that stands out, it's called Season of Life by Jeffrey Marks. And it is, uh, is it, it is about Jeffrey Marks, who is a writer, a journalist, who reconnects later in life with a guy named Joe Airman, who's coaching high school football, but had previously played for the Indianapolis or Baltimore Colts, I believe. And uh, the author, Jeffrey Marks, was a ball boy for them. And he reconnects with them later in life. And Joe Airman has gone through this sort of transformation from sort of 1970s NFL wild man to, you know, leader of young men, high school football coach and pastor. And it is a book about uh, relationships, uh, male relationships, really like uh, why a lot of 30, 40 plus year old guys don't have a best friend and, and why, you know, how masculinity is, is looked at. And it's a very powerful book and I would highly suggest it to anyone. I've read it three times, I think, uh, it's been a while. I should give it another look. I remember reading one of the stories in it where Joe Ehrman is talking about his brother dying of cancer. I was reading it on an airplane. I was crying in the seat in the airplane. Maybe the people next to me looked at me weird, but uh, great book, Season of Life, highly suggest that. Um, yeah, so that, that, there's a lot of questions. I'm gonna do more episodes. I can drink beers more frequently and talk to you fun folks on uh, on the internet. You know, here that now that we're in Corona Mania, every other day, probably not every day. I shouldn't do that. But thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Cheers. See you next time.